Thank you. Um, so this slide uh, just talks about our company on Benfield. Um, we're an uh, intermediary, financial services intermediary uh, between insurance companies. And uh, Peter and I belong to the investment banking um, division within Aon Benfield. Uh, Aon Benfield has a, several different uh, analytics uh, software systems. Um, what we'll present today is called Pathwise. We also have some other things, like Remetrica is a, we do a lot of um, analytics around like catastrophe modeling and things like that. Uh, and actually Remetrica is something interesting. It's like a box and arrows type of visual system, but that's a different group, not related to us. Uh, we'll talk about Pathways. Um, the industry that uh, we address is actually very similar problems as what um, Jean-Marc was talking about. Uh, we focus on a very specific type of derivative, which is called a variable annuity. Um, this is a it's a life insurance product sold um, in different countries as a retirement savings vehicle, and it contains embedded options. Uh, here you can see, basically, the blue line is your account value, your investment over time, and the red line is a, is a guaranteed uh, account value that the insurance company guarantees you'll get back when you decide to retire. And it has some uh, path dependency, so it, it jumps up every once in a while. And uh, this thing has is a, is a very risky financial derivative for the insurance company. It's also very long term, like 10 to 30 years. And there's, there's uh, complexities that are specific to insurance products. Um, kind of like Jean-Marc was talking about the exercise. Usually systems assume it's automatic exercise versus a discretionary exercise where there could be suboptimal, uh, what we call policyholder behavior, which is the retail uh, customers may not behave optimally, um, or they may have some reason that they need to withdraw money even if it's not optimal at that time. Uh, so um, we, had, we we have to use Monte Carlo simulation to value these, uh, these insurance contracts. Um, large insurance companies might have, say, five million insur insurance policies. Each one must be individually simulated with, let's say, 2,000 scenarios. Plus, you need to do shocks, uh, shock the input values, perturbations, uh, to get sensitivities. So you could look at something like 100 billion scenarios that need to be simulated. And we want to do this in, say, five minutes uh, because we want to value this in real time as the market conditions change uh, to hedge these contracts. Um, so there's a number of computational challenges here. Um, we have an end user focus, so um, the, each, each insurance product is going to be a little different from the other, uh, and they're always coming up with new ones, plus there's actuarial modeling on top of the financial guarantees about policyholder behavior and mortality, and we can't really be specifying that ourselves for our customers nor can we get like software developers to hard code these things. We need the end user to enter the logic uh, themselves. Um, um, so there's, and there's changing, there's all kinds of things always changing, regulations, the products themselves, the actuarial methodologies. Every quarter, they, the actuaries will tweak some assumptions to control their reserve levels. Um, as I mentioned, it's a very computationally intensive problem. So we have to, uh, you have to leverage uh, high performance computing. And finally, these are mission critical systems or business critical systems. Um, they have to run in an automated fashion and be um, everything that you would associate with production. Um, uh, so just looking at uh, one aspect of this, that um, uh, changes and the traditional approaches taken is, you know, enterprise IT, as we know, is not going to act fast enough all the time. Um, and then what you get is shadow IT systems, mainly using Excel. Um, there's a little comic here. It says, uh, I've isolated the origin of the firm's demise. So um, we find that uh, Excel is the ubiquitous uh, solution to these problems. But Excel doesn't really, uh, it solves some end user problems, but it creates a lot of other problems. Plus, it's a performance is not there. so. You know, we find that, so we wrote a paper that goes into more detail, but what you'll find is maybe an actuary writes a Monte Carlo simulation in Excel and then writes some VBA code to then 
load mo new scenarios and recalc the spreadsheet. <laughs> and so it's very slow. Uh, so that doesn't just doesn't work. Um, mission critical. Um, as I said, we have real time uh, requirements, um, near real time, um, and there's other uh, operational um, aspects like running a daily hedging program. It's um, there's a lot of money at stake, so the cost of error is very high, uh, and there's regulations that have to be uh, to comply with. Um, I'm going to move over to talking about uh, GPUs. Um, maybe you already know about this, and it's just review. I apologize, but uh, we solved the performance problem by using something called graphics processing units. Um, these are specialized processors. Uh, they, you can think it has nothing to do with graphics. It's just a historical coincidence but uh, that it came from the graphics processing industry. But what it is is a, a massively parallel processor. So your CPU might have eight cores these days. Um, a GPU would have uh, several thousand cores. Um, these cores are not the same as a CPU core. They lack uh, certain interrupts that you would require to run an operating system, for example. So you can't run an OS on it. They're also slow, lower clock speed and they're like it's like the old thing, you know, would you have two oxes or a thousand chickens pulling your cart? And so these are like a thousand chickens. Um, but they're, for throughput problems, they're, they're economically better in terms of what I mean is throughput per dollar. So our customers might have like a 5,000 core CPU grid as a several million dollar per year cost. Um, so our, the way that we sell our services and software is to say, well, we can reduce that cost and we're seeing something like 50 to 500 fold uh, computational uh, throughput improvements. <laughs> um, these are, so each, each processor vendor gives uh, something called the theoretical uh, floating flops ratings, which is like a super idealized situation where if you did every, if you, if you did one multiplication followed by addition, followed by mul multiply add, multiply add, multiply add, and everything worked out fine, and this is the maximum that processor can achieve. So the blue lines are the Intel um, Intel and, and processors, and the green lines are the NVIDIA GPU processors. This, these charts are obviously from NVIDIA, the vendor, but um, but this is true. Uh, th these are based on you know counting the number of floating point units and their and their clock speed, and saying this is the real theoretical throughput. Um, so. In terms of floating point throughput, GPUs are um, uh, much like orders of magnitude faster, and uh, and the gap is growing. And we see the same thing for memory throughput. So the most problems that we encounter are actually memory bound, um, and so uh, at least within the GPU, even if it's a simulation. Um, so the memory throughput is also. It's not as big of a difference, but it's, it's, there's big differences, uh, material differences, um, and this has to do with again. Par this is all to do with parallelism. It's because you have thousands of cores, and because uh, we're accessing the memory in in uh, very wide vectors, so we can get higher throughput than a CPU. Um, these are just looking at two different models of GPUs uh, that were released in uh, one in 2010, one in 2012. Um, the latest one has Tesla K10 at 3,000 cores. Actually, two processors on one card, but anyway, um, and eight gigs of RAM. And so, the, this is just showing that they continue to improve, um, kind of like Moore's law, uh, where CPUs are, are are not doing the same thing. Um, so this is a, a logical diagram of the. GK110 processor, uh, you can see that it's it's a big big thing. I think seven billion transistors. Um, I think it has. So the, the the processor is divided into these little blocks called uh, SMX Cement Streaming Multiprocessor. So this processor is really a grid of processors, and the way you program it is as if it was a grid. It has these sixteen. Uh, processors, each of those the streaming processors has, I don't know, a lot of cores. It's changed now, but it used to be 64 cores or something. It's a, uh, so each one of, just looking at one of these is this thing, which is 
tunnel cores, plus other things, double precision units, um, war schedulers, register file, different types of memory. So the GPU memory hierarchy is about five, uh, five layers, it's five different types of memory uh, when you're programming a GPU. So, uh, and then, so it's, it's a fundamentally difficult thing to program. Uh, especially for somebody who uses Excel, right? Um, with texture processors, like it's just uh, wild. So, and then if you, so NVIDIA, they tried to make it as easy as possible. They have something called CUDA, it's an extension of C. <coughs> um, and this is what it would look like to, on the CPU side, to, to, to run a GPU program. You have to, you have to do some CUDA malloc calls, mem copies, launch a kernel, copy stuff back, you have to remember to free the memory, synchronize with the device, um, you have to, it's kind of like programming an embedded uh, hardware because there's things happening on this device, but if something goes wrong, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like a black box, your data is sitting on this device, you can't just easily get it, you have to use special debuggers or modify your latest versions you can do a printf, but early versions you couldn't print out, for example, from your program. So all I'm getting at is that it's very hard to program these, even if you're an expert programmer. Um, plus there's a, so when you're writing CUDA, there's, you have to use two compilers. Use a normal C++ compiler for the target the CPU, plus run another compiler, which uh, is supplied by NVIDIA, and which then embeds that uh, object to compile CUDA program in, into your binary, it's uh, it's not simple, and um, definitely not uh, user friendly for normal businesses. Um, even for a team of experts, it takes several months to get a, a model, imp like a financial model, implemented. And by the time it's done and tested, it's, the situation has changed. So it's not practical. Um, so this is where uh, we start talking about the main specific languages. Um, so, looking at four dimensions here, uh, specialization is um, uh, hardware specific code. So the more of this, the worse. Uh, flexibility is but rapidly making changes. Um, reliability is you know the end artifact of whoever wrote that, or built that thing. You know how reliable is it likely to be, or is it going to be full of bugs like memory leaks or something? Um, and then the performance. So we're looking at these are not based on real numbers, they're just illustrative, but looking at uh, domain-specific languages, scripting languages like Python, uh, real programmable gatorades, and ASICs. So ASIC, it's like you're gonna, custom ASIC will be extremely fast. So your algorithm is in the hardware. Uh, it costs $100 million, um, so it's not practical. Um, and uh, FPGA is also, you need electrical engineers to, to program a FPGA. Um, and you have to convert your algorithm to a circuit diagram. So that's not pr practical either. Uh, scripting languages are very popular, but they, they just don't, the performance is not there. Uh, and reliability is also a problem. Uh, like Python, there's no type system. Sort of, so, um, now, how would you build a domain-specific language? Well, okay, so domain-specific languages we find, uh, you know, are, are unique in these trade-offs uh, and these types of properties. Um, so, how would you go about building one of these things? Uh, well, it turns out that there's a lot of tools that are already there. Um, so this talk is kind of like John Prescott's talk was like how a functional programmer <laughs> might approach it. This is like procedural programmers look at the world. Um, we're not thinking so much about um, formalisms. We're just thinking about how to, how to get this thing working. And uh, there's this project called LLVM, which is um, a compiler infrastructure, open source compiler infrastructure. NVIDIA has contributed uh, to this, as well as Apple and Google. Uh, NVIDIA's contribution is uh, the back end. So you can, you can target a CPU, you can target uh, NVIDIA GPU or ARM or anything else um, by reusing LLVM. All you have to do is uh, write a parser, 
parse the business logic into your AST. Um, you have to convert your AST to something called LLVM IR, which is intermediate representation, which is a type of, um, you can think of it as an assembly language, but it's an abstract assembly language. It does not, not specific to any hardware architecture. Then you get LLVM to optimize your uh, IR and then call some backend for specific hardware target. Uh, in this case, we call NVPTX. PTX is parallel thread execution. It's the NVIDIA's uh, abstract assembly language. And then we get uh, something that we give to the GPU device driver, which takes the PTX assembly and does more stuff to it and runs it on the actual hardware, uh, which is the GPU. So all the hard parts, which is the optimizations and back-end generation of machine code is all taken care of by the LLVM project. We just need to generate this IR and you know parsers, well, there's, there's, there's old territory, so you don't have to worry about too much about it. Um, I mean, like there's, this conference I understand is about like DSL workbenches and stuff, so in our case we kind of just hand-rolled um, simple parsers and, and just do this manually. Um, so to give you an idea, uh, so this could be like a domain specific language, a function in a DSL, um, which is a function called foo, takes three arguments and returns this uh, calculation, this expression. This is the LLVM IR for that function. See x0, x1, x2, uh, there's a lot more going on here. It's, it's, it's telling, it's, it's an assembly language, it's using three three arguments and an instruction and uh, talking about which registers data will be um, stored in. Um, you don't have to manually write this, this is generated using LLVM. And then finally, this thing uh, becomes this thing in NVIDIA's PTX assembly. You definitely can't handwrite this thing, but uh, this, this, this can then go to the device driver which decides uh, oh, you're running this model of the GPU uh, architecture, so it will do a further compilation to make it specific to that GPU and run the machine code. Um, so, using this type of technology, um, we created something called Pathwise Modeling Studio, um, which generates those GPU programs um, to by allowing end users to enter uh, basically the cash flow logic and scenario generation logic to value derivatives. Uh, this tool is in use in production by several life insurance companies. Um, there's something in news about it a few years ago. Uh, we were also awarded uh, the IDC HPC Innovation Award last year um, in the financial services category. Uh, what they were looking at here is cost savings. So they, were, they wanted to award projects that in high performance computing that save money. Um, and so we argued that by eliminating teams of CUDA programmers uh, and using DSLs we save money, uh, which is true. Um, so the way Pathwise Modeling Studio works is that there's a spreadsheet-like uh, projectional editor. Um, and uh, that compiles, um, generates code that can run on GPUs. That code is also deployed to an environment by the tool, so it's usually a grid of GPUs. We don't just use one, we might use like 100. Um, so, and we integrate, so the code that gets generated is, uh, it includes all the middleware interfaces to run on a grid. So the user doesn't have to know about middleware or the grid, but it, it, their program runs on the grid of GPUs. And then it, once it's deployed onto a grid, uh, this program is running there. It's kind of like a function. So I give it some inputs, and I'll give you back some outputs. Um, but for the user to, to run the program that they've created, we provide a Python-based uh, interface so they can script um, certain aspects of the problem, like load today's um, policyholder data and the latest assumptions and submit it to the grid and then get back the results and sum them up in different ways. So that's all done in Python um, just because we, we didn't want to 
we wanted to limit the DSL's focus on on the hard problem, and you know, Python is good for certain things that we want to just reuse that. Um, so this is what uh, Modeling Studio looks like. Uh, we start out by creating a new model. There's two types of models currently. There's Monte Carlo and Data Parallel. Uh, turns out that initially we only had Monte Carlo. It turns out that we it was trivial to um, also modify it to do certain types of data parallel calculation. So let's say a Black-Scholes equation. Um, we can just write, enter the formula for the uh, Black-Scholes stock or Black Scholes option pricing formula, and then it, this tool can automatically parallelize that uh, across the GPU and the grid. So if for some reason you wanted to evaluate the Black-Scholes formula a billion times, um, that's simple. Uh, but the main the main purpose is Monte Carlo simulation, where what we're parallelizing is across Monte Carlo scenarios, as well as across policyholders. So each policy, there's one million policies, all of those can be done in parallel, and then within a policy, all of the scenarios related to valuing that policy are done in parallel. Um, so there's some version control stuff, and uh, you give it a name. Um, first step is to define inputs. So we define input tables, um, kind of like Microsoft Access. Uh, column name type. There's some differences, so we can give it a shape. So a column can contain a table. Um, um, we have, let me have random number generation uh, uh, features. So from within this tool, you can um, sample sample like normal distribution or exponential or Poisson or whatever and specify which uh, which uh, random number generator algorithms you want to use and correlation matrix so this is not only um, letting you write down your simulation logic but also the scenario generation logic um, which is useful on, in its own right like if you want to do calibration scenario generators it's also a computationally intensive problem. So we sample things using RNG calls. Um, the rows here are time steps. Uh, so it's a simulation over time, the rows of time steps, dynamic number of time steps, and columns are uh, user-defined expressions. Um, there's nice features like auto completion. You can create UDS. UDS that take uh, matrices as inputs and outputs, for example. Um, um, uh, I mentioned we have columns that can contain uh, tables. Oh, well, yeah. Um, this is just showing outputs. So once you define your inputs and your calculation, you can define outputs, something called the Greeks, which are um, sensitivities. Uh, then you commit your code to a central repo. Uh, and you compile it, deploy it to grid. Um, this is a grid management tool. We can run uh, GPUs on the Amazon cloud. Um, to, to, to take advantage of elastic GPU computing resources. Um, the tool will also generate sample Python code to tell you how to interact with the grid middleware uh, for your model. Uh, this is the Python IDE which we package with it um, and it's modified so you can get feedback from the grid in, in terms of progress. Uh, um, so, and then you get the, all the nice things in Python which is kind of like MATLAB. And then finally, uh, we have other tools that integrate with our modeling layer to do, for example, like real-time risk dashboard um, as a service to our clients. Thank you. And then those last screens you were showing us were essentially, in that you had a, one slide where you showed us the, the basic workflow, and these are really were basically that first part, right? Yeah. The screens you were just showing us were from that part of the workflow. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you enter this logic into Pathwise Modeling Studio and then compile. Um, there's also this Python uh, aspect. And there's the, uh, you, you talked about applying the variable annuity. Is the work that you've done inherently applicable to other instruments besides the variable annuity? Um, it is. Uh, we. We help our clients um, manage hedging programs. Uh, so they're hedging the variable annuity, but they're using various types of uh, market tradable derivatives 
Um, so we model those in here as well. Uh, it's particularly useful when you have a Monte Carlo problem. Um, if you just want to use like the Black-Scholes equation or an interest rate swap, it's also useful for uh, nested simulations. So we'll simulate hedging itself, and then it turns out that okay, swap is easy to value, but we need to do it a hundred million times within a, you know a couple hours to get the simulation results. So we accelerate like things like swap calculations on GPUs, not because swaps are hard to value, but because when you want to do a big simulation using swaps. And so would the uh, developer set up those two simulations differently, and then in the analytics studio, someone would say, well, I want to see hedge performance, so I'll run both of them at the same time and see how the hedge performs, or? Um, yeah, so in analytics studio, um, uh, so in Python, uh, yeah. you'll, you'll write the computational steering logic of doing such a simulation. So what you use, what you created with modeling studio is like a valuation function. It's just right. given inputs, it gives you the value of your derivative. Now what we want to do is simulate the evolution of that derivative over time, change the input parameters based on some real world scenarios, um, and then bring in other derivatives as hedging. And you know maybe in, in each time step, you need to run like a linear optimization, for example. That's all done through Python because it's like a steering problem. Right, exactly. So you, you mentioned that, I guess, that we all know that debugging GPUs is hard. So what sort of debugging support do you have, especially since maybe the people consuming the models are different than the people who wrote the models? Mm -hmm. um, well, the primary thing is that, so you know, remember, these the rows are time steps and the uh, columns are expressions. The numbers shown here are guaranteed to be the same as what would come out of the GPU up to machine precision. So you can choose whether you want double or single precision, but this number will always match if you were to modify your GPU program to dump out all the intermediate states. This is what you would get. You can switch which scenario you want to look at here or which policy you want to evaluate. Um, so there, we, can, oh, we also have debugging tools, so like if you want to put a breakpoint here, you could do that. But the main, the main advantage is that they can see the whole calculation, the same reason that people use Excel. It's not going to be. It is not, uh, in fact. Um, CUDA provides a lot of um, support to, to run everything that runs on their. So their libraries always have a CPU and GPU version. Um, plus, we can do the same trick. So all the math libraries, everything. As long as you're not doing too much volume, you need to simulate. Right, right. This, we call that local run. Questions? Yes, I don't understand exactly the, who are the kind of people who are writing these Python scripts. It, it's not an end user, it's uh, the, the, your, your clients are other companies from what I understood that I use. Yeah. Which um, right, so. For instance, yes. yes. So in Modeling Studio, there's a button you click and it generates the sample code. Encouraging you to be the end user who writes Python code. It takes some. Some people are jump right into it. Some people, we off. We say, look, we can build everything for you, and then show it to you, and then you can choose whether to continue paying us to modify it or, or you do it. Um, Python is. We only use a very small subset of it, and they're usually used to like MATLAB already, so it's not that bad. But it is uh, end users. Yeah. Let's thank America. Thank you.